Bom dia a todas e a todos que aqui estão presentes e a toda a nossa audiência online. Esse é o terceiro dia do nosso sexto Congresso de Direitos Fundamentais e Processo Penal na Era Digital, que é organizado pelo Internet Lab com o apoio da Faculdade de Direito da USP. É, meu nome é Francisco Brito Cruz, eu sou diretor do Internet Lab é, e vou, vou acompanhar essa manhã derradeira do, do Congresso. É, relembrando, antes de começar a nossa primeira palestra, que algumas questões. A primeira é que essa palestra conta com tradução simultânea, tanto no online como é, no presencial, é, e a, a seguinte vai ser em português mesmo. É, e, em segundo lugar, lembrar que estamos lançando nesse congresso o registro do congresso do ano passado, né, do quinto congresso, em livro. O livro está disponível online para quem quiser baixar de graça e é, é também a versão física é como brinde para apoiadoras e apoiadores do Internet Lab. Esse ano também lançamos uma edição pequenininha, um livrinho pequenininho do Direito das Investigações Digitais no Brasil, que é um compilado, aí um panorama do tema que o Internet Lab já tinha feito em 2016, 2017, e esse ano a gente reeditou em formato de livro, um livro muito especial para nós. É, bom, para aqueles do Zoom se lembrarem como é que a tradução é realizada, a tradução é realizada clicando no link da interpretação, né, que é um pequeno globo que fica na parte de baixo do Zoom, para é, a apresentação em português, e aqui é só pegar o aparelhinho da tradução. Né? Bom, tenho muita felicidade de contar com o nosso segundo keynote speaker, aqui é, o palestrante, o professor Bennett Capers, é, que vou apresentar, acho que é um, um prazer enorme é, é, contar com a presença virtual dele, é, fazendo os votos que na próxima vez que ele estiver no Congresso, ele esteja presencialmente em terras brasileiras. Mas, bom, o professor Bennett Capers ingressou em 2020 na Faculdade de Direito de Fordham, lá ele leciona é, as disciplinas de provas, direito penal e processo penal, e é também diretor do Centro sobre Raça, Direito e Justiça da mesma universidade. É, bom, ele é ex-procurador federal, seus interesses acadêmicos incluem a relação entre raça, gênero, tecnologia e justiça criminal. Um escritor é, é, com várias, várias obras sobre esses mesmos tópicos. Foi professor visitante na Faculdade de Direito de Fordham durante é, a década de 2010, desculpa, de 2000. E também é, professor visitante na Faculdade de Direito da Universidade do Texas e na Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Boston. Né? É, recentemente, ele, se, ele é, na, na primavera né, de 2022, será professor visitante na Faculdade de Direito de Yale. Antes de lecionar, passou quase 10 anos como procurador assistente dos Estados Unidos no Distrito Sul de Nova York. Seu trabalho em vários casos de extorsão federal lhe rendeu uma indicação para o prêmio de diretor do diretor do Departamento de Justiça de 2004. Também praticou é, como advogado é, em diversas firmas nos Estados Unidos, em diversos escritórios. Bom, sem mais delongas, passo a palavra para o professor Bennett para sua exposição como keynote speaker e é, apenas lembrando que quem tiver perguntas presencialmente ou quem tiver perguntas é, no Zoom, é, é, que pode ir anotando as perguntas no Zoom através da ferramenta de perguntas e respostas, de Q&A, né, Q&A, é, aqui pelo Zoom, que aí no final a gente faz uma rodada de perguntas para o professor Bennett. É, e é isso, com isso, passo a palavra para ele. Professor, está contigo. Thank you, thank you very much for that warm introduction. Uh, so I will start by saying that when uh, Barbara Sameo, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, asked me to deliver uh, the keynote at this conference, I said yes pretty quickly. Um, I said yes uh, because I was intrigued by the topic, fundamental rights of criminal procedure in the digital age. Um, her email added, and I'm gonna quote from her email if you don't mind, we consider your participation of great importance given the Brazilian situation. Currently, our federal, I'm sorry, currently our Supreme Federal Court recognizes the constitutional status of data protection. And at the legislative level, despite the enactment of the general law for the protection of personal data, 
we do not yet have a general law addressed to protect information collected for the criminal procedure or public safety purposes. In addition, Brazil has a history of poor regulation of the use of force and other methods of police intervention and faces increasing scrutiny of these um, agents and their biases. Um, so that that intrigued me as well, obviously. Um, I also said yes to the information for entirely, well, I think of entirely selfish reasons. Um, I'd never been asked to deliver um, a keynote address in Brazil before. Uh, so part of me was like, wow, Brazil, you know, even if it's via Zoom. Um, and, you know, my enthusiasm <laughs> isn't entirely like what I might, uh, what you might think from what I just said. I think like most American legal scholars, I know almost nothing about legal processes outside of the United States, which means I know almost nothing about legal processes or criminal processes in Brazil. So although I'm going to uh, focus my talk on the situation in the United States, I'm also hoping to learn from all of you uh, during the Q&A session so I can get sort of a little bit of a comparative education today. So in the time that I have, I'm going to speak about my own exploration of criminal justice and technology um, and race, uh, which is uh, you know, one of the issues that most concerns me. So just a little bit of uh, more background. Um, I come to this topic um, as a law professor who writes and teaches about US criminal law and about the US constitutional protections that limit what the police can do. Um, and obviously, for that reason, I probably stand out at this conference. I'm, again, an outsider to your jurisprudence. Um, I also come to this topic as a Black man. Um, and in the U.S., that means, I suspect it means the same thing in Brazil, that I will always be subject to hyper surveillance because of the color of my skin and also because of my gender. Um, you know, some years ago, a young academic wrote a paper that I love um, citing um, because of its title. And the title was Young Plus Black Plus Male Equals Probable Cause. Um, so I suspect that um, I no longer qualify for the young part, <laughs> but I'm still like, you know, black and male which means that I'm still subject to a lot of police scrutiny and surveillance. Um, you know, as Fred mentioned, I also come to this topic as a former federal prosecutor. Um, and I belong to an office that as part of the war on drugs prosecuted lots of blacks and Hispanics, um, in addition to you know, other cases and white collar crime. Um, but there I saw firsthand how technology was and was not being used in law enforcement. So I come to a lot of my research and scholarship as you know, as a law professor, as a black man, and as a for, uh, former federal prosecutor. And I try to bring all of this to the table when I think about uh, criminal justice um, and race and technology. Um, and you know, I think saying a little bit about this background probably explains why, even though I write about uh, courts and the law, um, you know, I have little hope that courts will remedy sort of the inequities um, I think about in the criminal justice system. Um, and it probably also explains why increasingly I focus more on the technology part rather than the law part. Um, I should also say upfront, that the argument I'm gonna to make today might be different from what most of you are expecting. Um, so my talk is not really gonna be about data protection. I'm happy to talk more about it in the Q and A. Um, you know, I can say briefly, like in the US, it's basically safe to assume there's no data protection when it comes to the, um, the law enforcement. We just carve out exceptions for law enforcement. Um, instead, um, what I'm going to focus on um, in my brief time is really solely um, the issues of technology and policing and race. Um, so um, I participate in lots of conferences on policing and technology, and usually the message is at, well, the message 
at these conferences is always the same. Uh, surveillance is an insidious assault on our freedom. Um, it's something that's heard frequently. Or, you know, to quote another scholar, it is nearly impossible to live today without generating thousands of records about what we watch, read, buy, and do, and the government has easy access to them. You know, the message is, you know, Big Brother is watching and we should be afraid. Um, now, while these concerns are not without merit, um, my scholarly interest um, in the intersection of criminal justice and technology is different. Uh, what interests me um, is harnessing technology to de-bias and de-racialize policing. As I have uh, written previously, um, the possibility that Big Brother or watch us does not have to be frightening. Um, so instead of um, a view of technology that feels like, um, you know, dystopia, I want to imagine the good that technology can do. In fact, what I want to suggest is that if we really truly care about making policing more egalitarian and fair to everyone, then that probably means more technology, not less. Um, and it will certainly mean the redistribution of privacy. So a few years ago, um, I wrote an article titled Afrofuturism, Critical Race Theory and Policing in the Year 2044. Um, and it's the policing in the year 2044 part that I want to discuss now. And by, by the way, 2044 was, um, I use that year because it's the year that in the United States, um, the country is, um, 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 is projected to tip from being majority white to majority, majority minority. Um, so that was sort of the idea behind the article. Um, and the 2044 part was really to focus not just on you know, what shifting demographics might mean, but also how advances in technology could radically change policing as we know it, uh, but in ways that we might welcome. So, so specifically, it was a way for me to think about technologies that can enhance community safety and lead to more egalitarian policing. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking about how, um, technologies could reduce the police use of force, especially against those of us who are black and brown. Um, and in short, one thing I was doing in my scholarship is sort of trying to find ways to encourage communities that experience the brunt of unequal policing to think seriously about what technologies might actually um, benefit them. Are there technologies out there that can address persistent problems we see again and again with policing. So I'm gonna give a few examples of what I mean by this. So can we harness technology to contribute to a reduction in crime? Um, so for this, I wanna just consider, or want you to consider some of the technologies we already have and the future technologies we could easily imagine. Um, usually when we think about the use of surveillance cameras um, or eye in the sky technology, um, um, and if you have questions about any of these technologies, I can address them during the Q&A, um, or the use of facial recognition technology or other biometric technologies, we tend to think of how flawed these technologies are. Um, and we tend to protest. Uh, against their use. Um, and for example, with facial recognition technology, one of the concerns you hear again and again in the United States is uh, facial recognition technology has trouble actually recognizing um, darker skinned faces. Um, but you know what we should also think about is how these technologies can be proved. So rather than giving up on them, thinking about how these technologies can be uh, made better, how we can uh, 
you know, um, iron out the wrinkles um, and how um, in improving these technologies, they might contribute to public safety in ways that are not discriminatory. So what I like doing is encouraging people to think about these same technologies that I just mentioned, but think about them without the flaws. Um, and, you know, add to that, these technologies, the likely instantaneous access to big data that we could imagine law enforcement having. Or imagine, uh, like right now, actually for years now, we've been experimenting with scanners, terahertz scanners, uh, that the police could use to remotely check to see whether somebody has an unlawful firearm. Um, think about the widespread availability of short range communication technologies that might eliminate entirely the need for traffic stops. Um, or even think about how the um, advent of self-driving cars might eliminate the need for traffic stops. Think about the deployment of um, autonomous drones uh, think about adding to machine learning. Um, think about a host of things. Some of you may have heard um, that in New York City, uh, where I am right now, yes, uh, the New York City Police Department is being sued for surreptitiously collecting <coughs> DNA from suspects. <coughs> There's also a lawsuit in New Jersey uh, that goes a step further. In New Jersey, uh, the police are accused of actually using DNA that was collecting from newborns in order to help them in a police investigation. And when people hear this, they usually are outraged, but we can easily imagine a world where the collection of DNA is not only authorized, but generally accepted, uh, where DNA evidence is, you know, collected from individuals at birth, um, along with, you know, other data so that everybody's DNA is on file. And all of this would obviously contribute to deterring criminal activity and improving apprehension within where there is criminal activity. And I know uh, all of this may sound frightening. That's usually the response I get. Um, but before I address that, um, consider something else. The technologies I'm talking about also have the potential to reduce unjustified police violence. So uh, surveillance cameras, including cameras held by individuals, privately held cameras, probably already deter some police misconduct. But imagine what happens when we add other technologies. So again, if we had scanners, scanners would be able to tell police whether suspect is armed or not, which might impact whether um, what type of force is needed. Scanners, um, uh, which are tied to access to big data, could probably also tell the police within seconds whether somebody has a history of nonviolence and thus reduce the risk of escalation. Um, future technologies, we could also imagine um, would allow police to disable weapons from a distance. Moreover, all of these technologies I've talked about so far leave a data trail to create more accountability on the back end. Uh, we already have, you know, predictive policing and algorithms and risk assessment tools. And to be sure, like these tools are flawed, but again, what if we could improve them? Equally important, what if we could, uh, flip the script, I don't know how that translates in Portuguese, but if we could turn things around and use the same tools to predict which police officers have the highest risk of engaging in unjustified uses of force. Again, before we dismiss technologies out of hand, we should think seriously about how technologies might benefit the rest of us. Um, I've also been exploring how technologies can help, you know, relatedly to police violence, just deracialize policing in general. You know, after all, cameras do not have implicit biases or suffer from unconscious racism. Uh, technology may be able to move us closer to, um, you know, like in the US, reasonable suspicion is needed before an officer can stop somebody. Technology might be able to move us closer to real reasonable suspicion. 
so that you know looks and encounters and stops and frisk turn on actual reasonable suspicion rather than simply turning on things like race and maleness and age. Um, as I've written before, uh, weapon scanners could tell the police that a bulge in a black man's or black teenager's pocket is nothing more than a bulky cell phone, um, but that the white tourist who looks like he's from Texas really does have a gun. Um, you know, facial recognition technology with access to big data would tell the police that the, you know, brown skinned driver repeatedly circling the block is in fact somebody who works in the neighborhood and is just looking for a parking space. And that the clean cut white guy sitting on the park bench is in fact a registered sex, off sex offender who's too close to a playground. In a way that's not intrusive, it would tell the police whether someone is a troublemaker casing a neighborhood or a student returning home with a bag of Skittles and a bottle of iced tea. It would tell the police whether somebody's a burglar about to commit a home invasion or a Harvard professor entering his own home. It would tell the police whether someone's a thug with a gun or whether that person's a police chief. It would tell the police whether that person's a trespasser attempting to enter the Capitol building or a US Senator. It would tell the police whether the person is a mugger looking for his next victim or a future U.S. attorney general. And it would tell them whether the white kid driving around the black neighborhood is there to get drugs or to see his black girlfriend. Um, and by the way, uh, I'm assuming most people in, the, in Brazil don't get the references to what I was saying, but basically I was referencing all these cases in the U.S. where the police have actually stopped, you know, um, a Harvard professor or um, a U.S. senator um, or future uh, U.S. attorney general uh, thinking they were engaged in criminal activity when they weren't, and they were stopped primarily because of their skin color. Finally, um, I want to make the argument that the use of more technology can help address a problem that rarely gets the attention it deserves at least in the United States. And that problem is something called under enforcement. And I don't know whether this is an issue in Brazil, again, my apologies, but it's definitely an issue in the US. And what I mean by under enforcement is this, at the same time, communities of color in the United States suffer from over enforcement and over policing, they also, suffer from its opposite, under enforcement. There are numerous studies that confirm that police are less likely to investigate and prosecute property or violent crimes in communities of color. Studies even show that police departments have a slower response rate to minority neighborhoods when people call for police. Even when the minority neighborhoods and the non-minority neighborhoods are equal distant from the police station. And all of this sort of has the you know, effect of sending a message to minority communities of dismissal and devaluation. But think about all the technologies I've been describing and how they would take over a lot of the work that police now do. If that's true, it might actually free up police officers to do what we actually want them to do, which is investigate and, and solve crimes. So again, I don't know the, what the numbers are in Brazil, but in the United States, nearly one third of all murders in this country go unsolved. <clears throat> For every three people killed, there's only arrest made in two of those situations. The number is even higher for other types of crimes. And um, I find this really troubling. So um, at this point, I'm just gonna say a few more words about, um, you know, uh, 
how frightening this might seem to some people of what I'm suggesting. So I know that uh, the technologies I'm describing may sound privacy diminishing. And I also recognize that current technologies are not racially neutral. I recognize too that uh, technology has been anything but a innocent bystander when it comes to mass incarceration in the United States. But as the sociologist um, Ruha Benjamin at Princeton University um, has said, well, not as she said, but she's even coined the term, the new Jim Code, a play on Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow to warn the technologies can perpetuate and exacerbate inequalities, especially when they have the veneer, the illusion of being free from human influence and bias. But again, none of this suggests that bias technology is inevitable. Biases can be identified and eradicated or at least minimized. Let me just give an example, like I'm just gonna return briefly to facial recognition as an illustration of this. As I mentioned before, one of the complaints about facial recognition in the US that's made every time somebody discusses facial recognition is the difficulty of recognizing black faces, the misidentification that happens. Um, and, and people re say this as if it's a, a, a flaw that cannot be fixed. What they fail to recognize is um, it has more to do with, uh, you know, it's basically um, bias in, bias out. Like um, it all has to do with what the inputs are. And what I mean by this is consider the fact that facial recognition technology developed and used in Japan and China actually has trouble recognizing white faces. It's not, it's, it's not the technology that has trouble recognizing faces, it's basically what inputs are put into them. So that suggests that, uh, you know, uh, adding more inputs or correcting the inputs or the balance of inputs with facial recognition technology can basically address the dark skin problem. This also sort of leads to my big picture argument that I want to press because what I really want to do is imagine more diverse people at the table in creating technology and in saying what type of technology they want. So, so much of my work is about imagining, you know, not a top-down approach to technology, but a bottoms-up approach. Uh, right now in the United States, firms that develop new technologies basically do them on their own and then uh, sell them to law enforcement and then law enforcement use them against the people. Um, it would be nice to imagine a world where the people actually sort of saying what kind of technology they work, they want, cr helping create it and then telling police how to use it. So, so much of my work is about imagining the benefits that would flow when the communities that are most police have the agency to produce technology, to create code, recode, and maybe as the young people say, drop a remix. Um, so again, to borrow from Ruha Benjamin, what interests me is thinking about how techno science can be appropriated and reimagined for more just ends. Um, so I think I'm going to end there, open it up for a Q&A. Like I said, I'm happy to talk more about race, policing, and technology. I'm also happy to sort of talk a little bit about data protections. Um, um, and that's it. Uh, excelente exposição. É, excelente e inspiradora. Nós vamos então para a sessão de perguntas e respostas. É, vou fazer blocos de perguntas. Alguém aqui quer fazer uma pergunta para o professor? Pode fazer também da plateia, não? Eu só sugeri isso para ele ver a pessoa. Alguém? Bom, vou mesmo fazer uma pergunta, então, para começar. É, mas 
a gente vê de novo na, na audiência daqui a pouquinho. A minha pergunta para o professor é a seguinte. Em imaginar é, a tecnologia de forma diferente, né, a partir dessa provocação que foi realizada, né, de e se tais tecnologias dessem certo, vamos dizer assim, né, é, não fossem tão enviesadas e potencialmente... É, violadoras de direitos em tantas dimensões como são hoje, né? Como o mundo seria? É, a minha pergunta é sobre um aspecto, vamos dizer assim, o que há de estrutural nessas tecnologias, do tipo uma tecnologia de reconhecimento facial, de captação de imagem, por exemplo, né? É, ela instala na sociedade, mesmo se ela funcionar muito bem, né? Uma um certo efeito. Né, de todo mundo saber que está sendo filmado, por exemplo. Né? É, ou uma tecnologia de detecção de DNA, mesmo se ela não for enviesada, né, e ela nos ajudar a, a saber a verdade, ela também instala na sociedade um efeito, que é um efeito de, é, é, da, das pessoas saberem que isso vai acontecer, eventualmente se policiarem naquelas questões que eventualmente podem ser consideradas erradas, mas que podem não ser, né? Aquelas questões que aparentemente vão ser consideradas erradas. Então, a minha pergunta para o professor nesse momento é isso, que, que, quais são as suas considerações, professor, quando a gente está falando é, dessas tecnologias funcionando bem, né? É, essas capacidades que se instalam na sociedade a partir de um funcionamento é, ideal dessas tecnologias, é, 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 como que a gente encara elas, né? Se numa visão de criação de tecnologia de baixo para cima, é, a gente tem jeito de resolver, vamos dizer assim, essa, essas tensões que vêm é, mesmo do funcionamento ideal. Alguém quer fazer mais alguma outra pergunta nesse bloco? Parece que tem uma pergunta na audiência, então você quer fazer daí ou você quer vir aqui? Vem, vem, vem aqui. A gente vai fazer duas perguntas Será? e aí depois passamos para as suas respostas. Pedir okay. para que você Será saiba, address... de saber é, o seu nome. Peraí. Descendo. É... Bom dia. Primeiro, gostaria de parabenizar o professor pela palestra. E a minha pergunta, que até parece uma complementação, mas talvez de uma forma um pouco mais direta, seria o quanto que nós podemos perder em termos de direitos fundamentais até que esse mundo tecnológico ideal seja alcançado. Obrigada. Obrigado. Vou passar, então, para o professor fazer suas respostas. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for these questions. I love these questions. So, you know, one thing I should sort of say up front is when people uh sort of worry about um you know the privacy they're losing uh when people make arguments that we need to nip this in the bud um before we lose all privacy um um you know certainly certainly we need to uh think about uh some limitations and some controls but we also have to recognize that um to a large extent extent uh um the game is already over like there's already so much surveillance uh that uh we should just assume that we're all being watched so um in the united states at least um according to information i have uh the average person in the united states is on camera 230 times a day Uh, there are over a hundred million cameras in the U.S. Um, that's one camera for every four and a half persons. Um, so when you think about that, surveillance is already everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, and we've we've already just <clears throat> apparently we've gotten used to it because I think most people probably. Uh, know they're on camera if you said to them you're on camera 230 times a day they might be surprised by the number but i think most people would not be surprised that when you look up walking down the street there are cameras everywhere privately owned cameras outside of stores government owned cameras on lamppost 
um uh so it's almost like the what we say the cat is out of the bag again i don't know how that translates in portuguese so one response is uh you know we've already gotten used to living under surveillance and while this might seem like an attack on our liberties or an invasion of our privacy i like coming at it a different way i like thinking about um, how what we have moved from and are moving to is we're moving from a kind of hard surveillance to a kind of soft surveillance. So imagine a world, let's just say, imagine New York City, where for decades um, you had police in police cars, police on the street, um, in a way, working hand in hand with uh, private individuals, the store owners, uh, store security, whoever. Um, and the focus of their attention was always disproportionately um, Black people and uh, Hispanic people. Um, and the focus wasn't just like looking at them and following them with their eyes, but actually physically following them and physically stopping them. Um, that was a type of hard surveillance. And the reason I bring that up is because when we had hard surveillance, privacy was not distributed equally. Uh, a white person had a lot more privacy than a person of color. That also um, connects to class. So the way uh, privacy protection works in the US is basically the more money you have, the more privacy you ended up being entitled to. Uh, whereas, for example, if you lived in public housing, you surrendered a lot of your privacy. Um, if you lived um, in a place that was densely compacted, you surrendered a lot of your privacy. So privacy has never been distributed equally. Now imagine a world that switches from that kind of hard surveillance to more soft surveillance, where everybody um, is under surveillance, but in ways that are not intrusive, in ways that are almost invisible, and in ways where, you know, the average person in the U.S. is on camera 230 times a day and doesn't even realize it. Um, to me, that kind of soft surveillance has the advantage of at least equalizing privacy. So white Americans who always enjoyed an abundance of privacy might now have less but at least Black Americans and Hispanic Americans now have more and it's much more equal. Um, so I don't know if that quite answers the questions, but that's, you know, um, I mean, we, we, we already know that, uh, yeah, if we, if surveillance is already everywhere. I mean, I, I'm picturing, uh, I mean, right now, come on, the government knows where I am. I, I'm, I'm holding a phone. <laughs> if I get on the subway, uh, you know, subways in, in New York are no longer tokens. You enter subways with a Metro card that tracks you, or you actually use your phone that tracks you. If you're driving someplace, you go through toll plazas. The toll plazas, almost everybody, nobody pays money anymore. You use a toll device on your car, which tracks you. Um, uh, so again, uh, to use an American expression, the cat's already out of the bag, the horse is out of the barn, I don't know. Okay, I hopefully you heard most of it. I don't know what the last sentence was, but if you could hear me now, the other thing I was gonna add was about data protections in the United States. Um, at the beginning, I said we essentially have none. Um, you know, we have the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, but basically our data protections that we do have are limiting what private companies can disclose to other private individuals. Mm -hmm. They do not really limit what the government or law enforcement has access to. So law enforcement in the United States can buy data from private uh, companies, vendors. It can 
subpoena data. And in the United States, a subpoena sounds fancy because it's a Latin word, but it literally means, I can tell you as a former prosecutor, it literally means nothing. It's literally a prosecutor sitting in their office, uh, sort of like, you know, typing two sentences into a form and giving it to um, a law enforcement officer to go serve. It doesn't require like convening a grand jury or anything like that. Um, and it requires um, almost not, no, no um, evidentiary standard other than it would be useful to an investigation. Um, they can get, so a subpoena can get a lot. Court orders can get even more. Um, and search warrants can get you everything, basically. And a couple of decades ago, um, just because when people hear search warrants, I think, oh, that's going to be a protection. A couple of decades ago, somebody did um, an analysis of search warrant applications in the federal system to see how many search warrant applications were denied. And it was something like three out of like several thousand had been denied. Um, so, um, I mean, and part of that is because in the federal system, we really do develop detailed probable cause before we ask for a search warrant. But, you know, I just want to like say like, you know, we sort of get what we want in the government. Obrigado, professor, eh, pelas respostas. Temos duas perguntas vindas do, da nossa audiência digital online. Eu vou realizar as duas perguntas aqui para o professor e já na sequência eh, peço para que ele eh, faça suas considerações finais já depois de responder as perguntas que a nossa programação deve avançar também temos outro painel eh, nosso painel de teses jurídicas que será realizado eh, na sequência então as perguntas que recebemos nos Zoom são as seguintes o Nelson Pinto perguntou o seguinte é, professor, como seria a vida se a polícia não tivesse acesso a informações privadas? Você recomenda algum tipo de controle contra isso? Falando também que a atividade criminosa agora tira proveito desse acesso. É, enfim, a segunda pergunta é, parabeniza o tema da palestra, do Antônio Araújo. Ele é, pergunta o seguinte, qual a avaliação que o professor faz sobre o emprego das tecnologias de policiamento preditivo que goza de simpatia de muitas autoridades de segurança no mundo e eu acrescentaria também no Brasil. Quais as impl implicações na privacidade do policiamento preditivo? Com isso, passo a palavra para o professor Bennett para que ele responda essas últimas perguntas e faça as suas considerações finais. Professor, por favor. Yeah, so thank you for those two questions, two great questions. So Nelson, if I understand the question correctly about the control of private data, I'm assuming what you're getting at is, uh, should we be concerned about the police having access to all this information and what how they might use this information? And the answer is absolutely. <laughs> so, Part of uh, my uh, vision for a future world and a future world where there's better policing is sure there's more data out there, but the data is not controlled by the police. The information is not controlled by the police. It's actually controlled by the people. So the people, communities actually decide where that data goes, how long it can be retained, um, who can get access to it. Um, one current problem in the US with even police surveillance data is police um, tend to uh, not only exercise control, but like really control it. So they deny giving access even to victims of crime. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining a different situation and also where community has not just a say in the protocols, but actually dictates what the protocol should be to for maintaining that information so it's not used inappropriately. Um, with respect to the question of predictive policing, uh, quite honestly, um, I and of all the technologies I am least 
um, interested. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm most concerned about predictive policing. Like predictive policing to me um, seems so flawed uh, that um, I would uh, hesitate to imagine a world where it's used um, um, in, in a real way. But that being said, we could imagine a world where it's more accurate. Um, you know, I, I tend to incorporate a lot of popular culture in my work. Um, so there's a film from a long time ago called Minority Report uh, that I use a lot of my in my work. We could imagine that kind of perfection. Um, and then it might be, we could revisit the issue. But right now, it just seems like uh, even calling a predictive policing seems overly optimistic. Um, so with that being said, uh, I just want to thank everyone for having me here. Um, I've enjoyed uh, making this presentation. Uh, hopefully you've uh, gotten something out of my argument. Um, and I want to thank the audience for the terrific questions. Enjoy the rest of your conference in Brazil. Muito obrigado, professor Bennett. É, foi um prazer tê-lo como keynote do nosso, do nosso congresso. E, bom, agradecendo o professor, aviso a audiência que vamos para o nosso coffee break. É, voltamos para o nosso painel de teses às 10h45, pontualmente no horário da nossa programação. Muito obrigado e até mais. Muito obrigado, professor. <música>